Welcome to Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. I'm Francine Lacroix and over the next 30 minutes will be your guide to the region's thriving market in exchange traded funds. Everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. Best month on record, European ETFs taken 21 billion euros, bringing total inflows for the year close to the 100 billion mark. We ask if investors can keep up the pace in 2021. Demanding diversity, State Street becomes the latest money manager to vow to use its voting power to make a company boards more representative. And making the switch, a technology hedge fund has turned itself into an ETF. We'll ask if the start of something big. Well, first up, let's get a look at which countries and sectors have been attracting the money. Our Danny Berger has all of the details. Hi, Danny. Hi, Francine. Well, we saw net outflows from European tracking ETF, 73 million to be exact. But leading the inflows this week was Germany with over $200 million worth of inflows. Most of that, if not all of that, was going to a climate change ETF in Germany. So not necessarily just Germany, German tracking, but rather a very specific ESG strategy. Now, we continue to see inflows into the UK. They've ebbed a bit, but we have seen some heavy inflows uh, after the transition period ended starting in the new year. Now, when it comes to outflows, Switzerland and Italy are two of the big ones, both about $150 million flowing out. Italy, of course, has some political drama. Perhaps that's driving some of those flows there, Francine. Uh, Danny, another another volatile week for Bitcoin. What do the flows look like? So the flows there actually were a pretty good indicator of things to come. You'll recall last week on the 7th, we had a record high in Bitcoin. At the same time, this Switzerland-based Bitcoin ETN saw its biggest outflow on record, and the outflows have continued in the day since. So this was probably a good one to track. If you wanted to get a sense of sentiment, perhaps it, it was a bit foreshadowing. Uh, and, and it could have been the same folks sending the price of Bitcoin lower as well. Of course, a few days after that record outflow, we also heard a warning from the FCA for people who are invested in Bitcoin products, Francine. Thank you so much. Our Danny Berger there with the very latest funds and flows. Now, joining us is Peter Thompson. He's Goldman Sachs Asset Management Head of European ETFs. Peter, there's certainly no shortage of news uh, since uh, 2021 started. How do, has that played out in ETFs? I think, you know, Francine is just a, a continuation of, you know, of, of, a, of a very busy cycle last year, given everything that's that's taking place. So whether it's uh, thematics, whether it's uh, ESG, whether it's uh, actively managed ETFs, it's just a, a continuation of, of growth in the market and, you know, multiple themes driving that growth. I mean, what's the theme of 2021? If you look at ESG, and I know we'll come back to it later, how much does that have to do with actually what we're seeing in treasuries and how much that's driving the ETF markets? Yeah, I think here in Europe, Francine, it is it is ESG. It is now front and center. I think we we hit an inflection point last year where, you know, this just matters, uh, you know, in a, in a very meaningful way with investors. And so, you know, those of us that are managing money and and uh, and putting funds in the market are are reacting to that and talking about it every single day. It's it's a really big deal. Um, Peter, is is there a way of looking at COVID, you know, through ETFs that you can't do in in, in just buying general stocks? I think you know specifically into COVID, it's it's tough, Francine. I mean, you could look obviously into the healthcare sector, and there's you know plenty of ETFs that that, that look in that area. So once again, you kind of go towards a sector or a theme. Um, but I but I think it's you know it's it's not so much COVID. It's 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 the the forward right on on how that's going to impact the market. And and so far as we've seen in the markets, you know they're. They're resilient and, and they're strong and inflows in the fourth quarter, particularly into the equity markets and ETFs, were, you know, were very healthy. Peter, I know we started actually last year talking about how much this ETF space can grow in Europe compared to the U.S., given where we are, given you know, some of the investing out there, but also some of the actively managed ETFs. Yeah. What's 2021 going to bring? I think you know another year of strong growth. So you know the 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 global market added over half a trillion in assets. So we're at about five spot five trillion. Europe was about twenty percent of that. Francine over a hundred billion again. 
So, you know, we expect that to continue and, and, and to grow, you know, from that base. I think Europe is still developing. Um, fixed income is still developing in Europe, you know, another great year in the fixed income ETF markets. So, you know, a continuation with just, you know, kind of an overlay of ESG on, on almost everything, I think. Uh, Peter, what's the, the one thing apart from ESG that you think will really dominate the European ETF market? Yeah, I think we're going to have, you know, we're going to have a big, a big year for what the market, you know, describes as thematics. And you can look at, uh, you know, AI or, or, or clean energy or, you know, the future of healthcare. Lots of just fascinating themes in there that are, you know, that are beginning to change. And I think people are starting to get a handle on, on what I describe as the forward Francine, kind of where these trends are going. And I think you're going to see a lot more money, you know, millennials, you know, moving into those kind of themes in, uh, in 2021. Thank you so much. Peter Thompson there of Goldman Sachs Asset Management stays with us. Now coming up, a technology hedge fund has transformed into an ETF, opening itself to a wider market. Could 2021 be the year of more opportunities for small investors? We'll discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe, everything you need to know about the funds and the flows. And I'm Francie Lacqua. Now, a small hedge fund specializing in tech investments has just made ETF history. It's become the first in the world to convert itself into an exchange traded fund. Now, the asset management <clears throat> industry had been watching out for a mutual fund to make the switch, but instead, the hedge fund upholdings group got there first. Let's get more with our Ksenia Gluchko, who heads up our EMEA equities team. Ksenia, why did Upholdings decide to convert their hedge fund into an ETF? Hi, Francine. So Upholdings Funds, which was running a tiny $3 million hedge fund, wanted to expand their investor base, and in particular to include retail investors. So they began exploring the process of converting their hedge fund into an ETF last March before formally making a filing with the SEC in October. Their actively managed Upholdings Compound Kings ETF began trading at the very end of last year. The founder and CEO Robert Cantwell explained their logic by saying that investors shouldn't have to be rich and invest privately to beat the market. So their move to convert the hedge funds into an ETF was about expanding access to high-quality growth investing to non-professional investors. Xenia, are we likely to see more conversions into ETFs going forward? I think that's highly probable, if I'm seeing. This is part of a bigger trend where we're seeing ETFs continue to take away market share and look more attractive than mutual funds and hedge funds. The main reasons are the ETF's ease of access and their cheapness, and that's really appealing to retail investors who are increasingly playing a more important role in the U.S. stock market. In contrast, mutual funds, for example, have been losing assets on a net basis for six years in a row now, and more hedge funds are closing than opening these days, and their fees remain under pressure. So now with the Upholdings Compound Kings ETF, we have the first conversion of a hedge fund into an ETF, and the market is now waiting for the first mutual fund conversion, which issuers including Guinness Atkinson Funds and Dimensional Fund Advisors have filed plans for. All right, Ksenia, thanks so much. Ksenia Gluchko there, who heads up our EMEA equities team. Now let's get back to Peter Thompson of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Peter, what's the read across to, to your world? Yeah, I, I think this is another um, kind of uh, legitimization of, of the wrapper, Francine, in terms of what it can do and how adaptable it is. And I think you've got a lot of organizations out there, asset managers, hedge funds, alternative managers that are thinking about you know, their client bases and, and in particular kind of the, the future client base, the millennials, the younger folks, how are they going to want to consume, you know, investment content and investments? And I think a lot of that is looking at the ETF market. And so, you know, the hedge funds, um, you know, the mutual funds that are looking at the conversion of some large funds, you know, the names you mentioned in particular dimensional, um, I think a lot of folks are out there looking at that and thinking, you know, how do we have to tailor our fund range for future demand, um, not just today's demand, but the demand that's you know that's coming in in a digital, uh, you know, mobile world. And I think this is another indication of of, of that trend becoming real. 
Um, uh, Peter, talk to me a little bit about the, the you know regulation trends in, in Europe. I know in the U.S. there's huge tax incentives to own ETFs. How do you expect regulation to change in Europe? Yeah, I think you know obviously we don't have the, the tax angle here that they have in the U.S. that makes that provides that further incentive. Um, but you've seen the regulators reaching out in terms of you know looking for example, uh, Francine, at non-transparent active wanting to have. Um, and publicly stating, you know, wanting to have discussions with the asset management industry about how they think and look at um, actively managed ETFs or non-transparent active ETFs. So I think this is a, you know, this is firmly on the uh, regulators' radar, and you know, we're going to have more of those conversations. We're going to see more of those resulting in uh, in new products coming to market. You know, I'd say as as soon as this year. Uh, Peter, do, do you know, is it difficult actually to see how much bigger the market will become in the next 12 and then 18 months? Well, I would think, you know, with, with two years running now of over 100 billion in growth in, in Europe, Francine, I, I, you know, I don't think many would estimate that that's going to go down. Um, and I think once again, we're, you know, we're kind of, I hope, coming into a sweet spot here. Most in the industry would say in Europe, we're five to 10 years behind the U.S., um, and you think of that kind of hockey stick graph, you know, we've clearly passed that inflection point and it's now, you know, how, how fast does the slope of that, uh, that line increase? But I think most of us are, are, are betting that, uh, you know, that this year will be a, you know, a bigger year than last. Uh, and Peter, how much does the ETF fixed income space actually grow? Yeah, I think it had a big year last year for, or sorry, in 2019, Francine, the first time we had greater inflows in fixed income than in equity ETFs. This year, we were on track to do that again until an equity rally, you know, in, in November and December. So equities finished a bit higher. Um, but I think you're going to con continue to see a lot of growth in the fixed income market. That's something at GSAM, uh, you know, very big part of our business that we're very much focused on, um, some other big players in that space. And I think more room in that space for development. Um, you know, with a history less of, of, of indexing and indexation. And I think the active side will be very prominent in fixed income. Peter, thanks so much. Peter Thompson there of Goldman Sachs Asset Management stays with us. Now, coming up, one of the world's biggest ETF operators is stepping up pressure on companies to do more to improve diversity. We'll discuss that next. Plus, your smart beta scorecard. This is Bloomberg. These challenges, I believe strongly, have to be talked about as investments. They're not just nice things to do or socially nice things to do, they're investments. If you want the feel of economics to be growing and to be taking on new challenges and innovating and using new methods and interested in new questions, you need to have diversity in it or else it's going to become a stagnant feel. We need to fund it in a way that is not so dependent on locational choice. So if we choose to locate in our where our houses are, are segmented by income and by race, then our education is similarly going to be uh, different by race and by income. Enshrining the priority of education in our legal system is a way of sustaining change over the course of many, many years. I think Ed can do a lot, but the private sector has got to be mobilized. Uh, Fed officials there are reiterating uh, the call for more diversity. Now let's stay with the subject and one of the world's biggest ETF operators stepping up pressure on companies to do more to improve diversity. Well, State Street Global Advisors says it will vote against corporate directors in the U.S. and the U.K. who don't disclose the racial and ethnic makeup of their boards. The money manager also warns from next year it will vote against boards that don't have at least one director from an underrepresented community. Let's get back to Peter Thompson of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Peter, are we going to see more asset managers do the same? I think so, Francie. And I mean, this is just a you know an absolute sign of the times. Um, you know that 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 board diversity is becoming so prominent. It's something here at Goldman. Uh, our CEO David Solomon last year at Davos made an announcement about you know promoting board diversity uh, in in our IPO and banking process. You know, so we're on 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 the record on this one. 
And I think many other voices will, you know, will will join that call. It's just becoming more and more important. It's, you know, just and we're listening to our clients, and they're telling us that this is something that's important to them. So I think, you know, you're just seeing the, you know, the beginnings of of quite a wave coming. How does that, you know, will it be enough to actually have a sizable change? Well, you know, I think it's it's just raising the profile of the of the topic, Francine, and right, and, and as it filters its way into you know, into the, the dialogues with, you know, with the investors, institutional or retail, and then through to the products and the investment process, it's it's going to drive this change, right? And and it's going to be demanded, I think, you know, increasingly. And here in Europe, you know, especially in the ETF market, I think we're, you know, we're leading in this space. You're seeing so much activity um, in, in ESG, you know, in, in the different uh, categories. And, and this is just a manifestation of that. I think just a, a you know a brilliant uh, you know wave and move that's 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 taking place, and we're right in the middle of but, it. Uh, Peter, how, how do you you know make sure that you, you play diversity through um, ETFs? Is it under ESG or should it have its own category? I think you you know you really have to you really have to ask because you're seeing that you know ESG SRI sustainability you know kind of label across you know both. ETFs and, and and other kinds of funds, investors need to drill down into that Francine and get answers in terms of the E, the S, the G. Right? Is there is board diversity a component of of, of how your uh, you know your your money managers are thinking about this? They have to ask those questions. There's a lot of information out there, you know, and all of us are ramping up in terms of the resources and and the people we have involved. In uh, in ESG, so there's so much more information out there. But I really encourage people they you know ask the questions, right? You know, put your money managers on the spot and see what they're doing in this space. Peter, thanks so much. Uh, more from Peter in a minute. But now let's take a look at the smart beta strategies, which have been gaining ground this week. Here's our Danny Berger with this week's smart beta scorecard. Hi, Danny. Hi, Francine. Smart beta ETFs that are listed in Europe had a massive, massive week, and that was really all dominated by flows into value ETFs. So we have to remember the week we're looking at is from January 5th to January 11th. So that captures this period when you had in the U.S. the Georgia election flipping the Senate to blue. So here is where we get that reflation trade played through ETFs. And that, of course, benefits some of these more higher beta types of factors, not just value, but size as well. That means smart beta ETFs saw their flow more than triple led by those two strategies. Dividend comes in a distant third, uh, bringing in $83 million worth of flows. Now, on the flip side, we actually didn't see any outflows this week, at least net outflows. We did see some strategies that were just flat on the week. For example, ESG was flat on the week. That, of course, doesn't really speak to the strategy's popularity because it's just one week. One week does not a trend make, and that has seen record inflows in 2020. So perhaps just a slight pause. One interesting thing to note with smart beta ETFs right now is that according to Bernstein research, factor correlations are at the moment are at the highest in at least two decades. That scares a lot of folks, makes things like multi-factor strategies not work as well. Uh, but for the moment, value still garnering a lot of interest, Francine. Danny, thank you so much. Our Danny Berger there with the very latest on the scorecard. Now let's get final thoughts from our guest this morning, uh, Peter Thompson of Goldman Sachs Asset Management. Uh, Peter, if you were to you know, look at some things and, and actually look at the state of the market, it could be treasuries, it, it could be also you know, piling up into Bitcoin and what it tells us about the state of what investors are looking at. Are, are we missing anything? I don't think so. You know, you, you've just you're, you're seeing some some pretty you know significant volatility, right? Uh, that Danny mentioned in, in the factor space, um, obviously in the in the in the Bitcoin space. You know, with this last week or two, um, so volatility is out there. I think that's here to stay. We're just you know we're in that kind of macro environment, Francine. Um, but I think you know with with ETFs in particular, you know you've you've got the ways to you know invest in these themes to take views in these themes. You know, efficiently, and I'd, I'd come back to that point of when you think about, you know, the the kind of new investors and the millennials and others, how they're going to access the market, um, the the ways they want to do it, and and the structures they want to use. You know, ETFs are just very prominent in that space. So I think we're going to continue to see this movement of funds, um, and and kind of be, you know, ETFs being kind of a lead indicator of where you know where market sentiment is and, and, you know, when where we see, you know, volatility increasing and decreasing. 
Do, how do you look at liquidity, Peter? I think, you know, once again, 2021 was a, you know, a great year in terms of kind of proving that case again, particularly in the spring, particularly in the fixed income markets where we had such great stress in the credit markets. Um, but ETFs came through, you know, with, with flying colors in terms of liquidity, accessing the market and, and being kind of a, a point of price discovery, Francine, for a lot of the less liquid parts of the market, particularly credit. So I think we're, we're in a good spot there. And, uh, you know, and it is, you know, it's made people more confident in, uh, in the way the market operates. Uh, is there anything that you would look at a stress point? So you feel more confident about the way the market operates. But if, if there were a stress point, where would you see it first? You know, I, I think maybe maybe in the credit space, right? But that's more kind of translating, you know, liquidity into, you know, bid offer and, and, and then, you know, the, 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 the supply and the underlying trading of the securities. But, you know, that's, that's worked before and been tested. I think in ETF space, you know, what, what people are looking at now is this, you know, the active part of that. And how does that work? How transparent is that? Um, does that translate into liquidity, Francine? You know, so far so good with it, but it's a, you know, it's a new part of the market, um, you know, that we're all working on. And I think, you know, this will be a year where we got get a lot, of, a lot more information on that, you know, around liquidity, trading volumes, et cetera, and what some of these big names are going to do. Um, you know, with, with active strategies. Uh, Peter, when you look at volatility, is there, you know, that there will be probably not each asset class is created equal. So where do you see the most volatility? Well, I, I still think maybe, you know, some of the themes, you know, we, we mentioned some of the factors have been, have been volatile, you know, with the, with the evolving political situations, you know, around the world, Francine. I think, you know, we're going to see, I would imagine we'll see more of that on the equity side. Um, you know, and, and through ETFs, you know, maybe in the next three to six months here. But, you know, in these kind of, you know, macro conditions, it, it's really hard to tell. Thank you so much for joining us. Peter Thompson there, Goldman Sachs Asset Management Head of European ETFs. Now, that's it for this week's Bloomberg ETF IQ Europe. We'll be back next week.